Hey, Bus Mob. Let's make sure we're connected here. Yeah, looks good. Um, I'm Dr. Fredman, I'm an Amelia surgeon in St. Louis, and excited to be here. Uh, we're gonna hang out for a little bit and answer any questions that you have on anything, breast and body, plastic surgery. Um, you guys already submitted some great questions, and uh, feel free to write any questions that you have uh, on comments here, and I'll answer them as I go. Um, so definitely chime in and uh, ask any questions that you have. Um, if you are watching this on Instagram, um, hey, uh, we're hanging out here on, on Facebook. Um, definitely uh, keep watching. But if you're not in the Bus Mob main Facebook group, um, definitely head over here, check it out. Uh, you will quickly see that the Bus Mob uh, Facebook group is just an incredible group of supportive women that um, can uh, can answer any questions that you have and just be here for you and you guys are awesome so I'm excited to get to hang out for a little bit and answer any questions that you have. I'm just going to take a drink real quick. Alright, so as you guys come on, if you have any questions, uh, definitely uh, write it in there and I'll answer them as I go. Um, but I'm going to start, I'm going to look at my list of questions here that you guys submitted and start just going through some of these and then as you have anything else you can write it in there. Um, okay so someone asked can you get a breast lift uh, slash augmentation without general anesthesia with only local? Um, I wouldn't. So th there are certain procedures that can be done under local um, and there are certain procedures that should not be done under local and in general um, it's really important in any surgery and in, in breast implants and a lift that the surgeon is able to uh, have control over making the perfect space for the implant, making the perfect incisions, doing everything uh, really well. And um, when somebody is awake and you have to make sure obviously that you're not uncomfortable, um, it makes it very challenging to have control over those things. So certain surgeries that are more invasive, a breast augmentation being one of them, and really a breast lift too, unless you're talking about a small revision of a lift or something like that, really should be done under general anesthesia. Um, doing it under local anesthesia is, would really be challenging for the surgeon to have control over making sure there's a perfect pocket for the implant, that everything is done exactly as it should be. Um, and general anesthesia, you know, that question probably stems from a fear that many people reason, you know, reasonably have of anesthesia. It's, especially if you haven't had surgery before, uh, it's scary. It's a time when you're not in control. Um, and uh, even if you've had surgery before, it's, it's scary. Uh, we get it. The thing is general anesthesia is incredibly safe. Um, there are certain things that are really important to discuss with your plastic surgeon before if you have certain medical problems or certain reasons that maybe you are at a bit of a higher risk. Um, but for, for most people, most people in this group who are, who are, are healthy uh, and even if you have you know, a medical problem that's well controlled, general anesthesia, general anesthesia is incredibly safe. Um, and it would be better to have the surgery done under general anesthesia and have lower complications, lower chance for needing a revision, um, all that, than try to get through on local but be really uncomfortable because it, it would be really challenging to do a breast augmentation uh, and keep somebody comfortable um, and do all of this and then not have as good of a result because you only want to have to do this once and doing it under local but then needing to have a revision kind of defeated the purpose. So. Um, so uh, that, that's the answer to that. Um, oh, and Chandra, thank you so much. That is very kind. It's an honor for us to get to be a part of um, patients' journeys you know, like yourself. So thank you, um, and thank you for, for saying that. That means a lot. It really does. Um, okay, so somebody else asked, how likely is it that a person would lose feeling in their nipples after a breast augmentation? After a breast augmentation alone, especially if we're talking about a breast augmentation with an incision in the crease under the breast, which is the most common place um, that somebody makes, makes an incision now, incredibly low chance 
uh, of losing nipple sensation. I mean, nearly zero. Um, uh, now there there may be people out there that that has happened to, but very 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 rare. And the reason is is because if you're making an incision in the crease under the breast, you're really not in the area where those nerves are. The nerves uh, run in a few different places, but uh, some of the major nerves that give sensation to the nipple run uh, a little bit below the skin. So uh, if you're down by the crease, a little bit below the skin in the area around the nipple. So if you're down by the crease under the breast, you're really not going to be interfering with those nerves. Um, what occasionally uh, people, people will describe as having some numbness in the lower breast which can kind of creep up to the area of the nipple after surgery. And that's maybe more from swelling um, and, and that gets better uh, as the swelling goes away. And anytime you make an incision, there's a chance of having some numbness in the area right around that incision. Um, but those usually get better quickly. So breast augmentation alone, uh, really shouldn't have to worry about nipple sensation. Um, if your surgeon is making an incision around the nipple, uh, even partially around the nipple for breast augmentation called a periareolar incision, um, which is not as common nowadays, but there are some people out there that, that will do that. Um, there may be a, a bit of a higher chance of that affecting nipple sensation, just logically anytime you make an incision around the nipple, there's going to be a bit of a higher chance of that affecting nipple sensation, but it's still going to be um, a really low chance. Um, a lift where you uh, are making an incision all the way around the nipple, there's going to be a little bit of a higher risk of that affecting nipple sensation. Um, now some people will have some numbness, and then over time it'll come back to normal as those nerves regenerate and the swelling goes down. Um, chance of permanently losing sensation in a nipple after a lift is really low. Um, so, so hopefully that helps there. And then for anyone just coming on, if you guys have any questions, uh, about anything, write it in here in comments and I'll, I'll answer it. But we'll keep going. Okay, so um, somebody asked here, they're having a tummy tuck with muscle repair and they exercise regularly, three to four days a week. Um, does it make a huge difference to incorporate a lot of core workouts? Um, and I'm not sure if, if you mean before or after, but either way, um, in a tummy tuck where you're doing muscle repair, the idea is, is that the six pack muscles have moved out to the side with pregnancy or weight changes. And with the muscle repair that happens during a tummy tuck, those muscles are pulled back in together, like basically like an internal corset. Start at the top and go all the way down with a stitch and that pulls the muscles together. So. Um, your core is going to be stronger afterwards because um, if you think about it, the muscle is not meant to be bowed out like this. It's not a very efficient way for that muscle to work. It, the muscle would much prefer to be lined up straight and aligned. So that's what happens with a, a muscle repair. Um, I would say in general, uh, as far as core workouts, you should do what you're usually doing. Um, I don't think you need to increase your core exercise before or after, or really do anything different. Just do what is normal for you. And that speaks to, in general, with body contouring surgery. Um, you want to go into surgery your normal self in terms of your weight. You want to go into surgery with your, your weight stable. It doesn't make sense to lose a bunch of weight, have surgery, and then gain it back afterwards. Sometimes people ask me, you know, how much weight should I lose before surgery? And for the most part, you want to go into surgery at a realistic weight that you can maintain. Um, but same thing with overall fitness. It doesn't do any good to um, you know, build up your muscle a lot before, have surgery, and then not as much afterwards. Uh, just go into surgery at your baseline where you're going to be, and that's a good place to be. All right. So. Uh, Anyone just joining, put any questions in here? Great, okay, you guys are answering, uh, asking great questions. So I have some more on here, but I'm gonna pause and I'll, I'll get to your guys' questions on here. Um, so Lynn asked, um, uh, one of my breasts has dropped badly after six months. Do you know what I can do? My right one's really bad. Um, sorry that, that uh, this is the experience that you've had and, um, 
it, I definitely understand how frustrating that can be. Um, you know, you, you're in this period of six months to a year where there still is some change happening. Not that the breast that has dropped is going to all of a sudden, you know, go back up, uh, but there still is change that's happening. So um, the first thing I would say is you want to be in communication with your plastic surgeon. Um, your plastic surgeon wants to know uh, if there's something that's changed that you're worried about or not happy about. Um, I think sometimes people worry that um, if there's something you're worried about or not happy about that your plastic surgeon is going to be upset to hear it or something like that and, and we're not. We want you to be happy. We want you to have um, a great result and if something's changing that's not in the direction that we want, your plastic surgeon wants to know about it. So um, first thing is to I don't know if you've already had your final follow-up, but if you have, call their office and, and get another appointment so you can go in and, um, and they can take a look and see what's going on. So as far as what to do about it, it depends really on exactly what's going on. If you have implants, um, okay, I see what you just said, that your plastic surgeon has blocked you after surgery, um, and I assume you're in the United States. Um, Okay, so the first thing I would say is it sounds like probably a revision is going to be needed at some point. If you have one, I don't know if you have implants or not, but if one side is significantly different than the other, um, probably some procedures can be needed to, to help with it. Um, I usually wouldn't do that until a year. So what I assume you're thinking is, okay, well, I gotta find a plastic surgeon uh, to do a revision. Uh, I would wait, as hard as it is, I would wait to about a year um, afterwards because once you get to, to about a year, you know that things aren't changing significantly. And uh, for me, that would be a good point for me to look at things. And for most plastic surgeons, I would assume that's when they would want to look at things and say, um, okay, this is kind of where things are. This is where things have settled. You said your left is perfect. That's great. You're happy with your left. Now what's happened with the right? And this is what would be needed. Um, to make it better. Um, maybe it's, uh, if you had a lift, maybe it's a another lift. If the implants have dropped too low, maybe it's uh, some pocket work to strengthen the lower part of the pocket. Maybe it's putting in mesh. So it really depends. But in general, I would wait to about a year and then find a plastic surgeon um, that you trust that you can talk to about doing a revision. Um, and the good thing to know, in, and you shouldn't lose hope, is that there's always a way to make things better. Um, there's always going to be some thing that can be done to make something better. You just need to find the right plastic surgeon for you and, and have a, a good conversation about that. Um, yeah, so maybe since you said you, you had a lift also, it may be that um, that side dropped too low and it needs to be lifted again. It, it's possible that that uh, would be what's needed. But again, I would wait till a year because it wouldn't make any sense to, to do anything now and then this happen again and then you have to have another revision. So you want to wait until things are stable um, and then decide what would need to be done. Of course, my pleasure. Let us know if, if we can help at all. Um, so uh, somebody asked, are arm movements restricted with just unders? Uh, or unders and overs. Um, so there's going to be, so whether your implants are under the muscle or over the muscle, you're not gonna have restricted arm movements when everything is healed and all that. So initially in those first weeks, you may feel different in terms of arm movements, whether you're under the muscle or over the muscle. I don't restrict my patients in moving their arms. Actually, we do something called rapid recovery here at Amelia where we have you moving your arms the night after getting implants, raising your arms up above your head, going out to the side. So the, those are rapid recovery exercises. So definitely not restricting your arm movements. We've found that by doing that, people actually recover quicker, require less narcotics um, versus the, uh, the kind of uh, older way of doing it where they would restrict your arm movements, tell you to just keep your arms at your side and reach for things like this. Um, and not move you know, for weeks and then you get really stiff. So I think that whether you're under or over not restricting your, your arm movements is actually a good thing. Um, and then once everything has, has you know, healed, there's, there's not gonna be any arm restrictions whether you have under or over. That's a good question. All right, so I'm gonna go back to my list, but if you guys have any questions, definitely chime in um, and we'll answer it. 
So someone asked, how common is nerve pain after liposuction or a tummy tuck? Um, great question. So nerve pain in general is not common after any of these surgeries, <laughs> um, but it can happen. Nerves are, uh, nerves act unpredictably. And part of the reason for that is because there are certain nerves in the body that as a surgeon I can see, but generally not where I'm operating in the surgeries that I do. Um, th those are bigger nerves and those are nerves that somebody would avoid. But um, most of the nerves that give feeling and sensation are so small that uh, you generally can't see them. So there's always going to be some interaction or interference or damage to nerves anytime any surgeon does a tummy tuck or breast augmentation or lift. Um, now generally that doesn't cause pain, that can cause some numbness. Uh, we talked earlier about nipple sensation changes with the lift. After a tummy tuck, it's pretty common to have some numbness in the area under the belly button. Um, sometimes that comes back and it can take a long time or sometimes there's always numbness in that area under there. Um, but anytime a nerve is interfered with, there's a possibility, possibility that there could be some nerve pain. After liposuction is uncommon, uh, after tummy tuck is uncommon. Um, the main thing, uh, if it is happening after a tummy tuck, you want to be in touch with your plastic surgeon about it. Um, there are a few specific nerves um, that in certain areas can get irritated by some of the stitches. Um, so if you're having like really specific pain, like I have shooting pain radiating down the front of my leg, that'd be something I'd want to know about because there's a nerve that specifically goes to that area and there may be some options of things to make it better. Um, if it's from liposuction or just general nerve pain, and, and generally we, we call nerve pain things that are like sharp, burning, stinging, uh, feeling like your you know, fingers are asleep, that type of feeling. Um, the other uh, thing that can be done in those cases is, is there are really good medications um, that specifically target nerve pain. Um, for example, gabapentin uh, is one of them. And uh, those, those are not narcotics and they can be really useful if you're in this period where your nerves are still healing and, and you're really uncomfortable because of nerve pain. That can be a good option of something to take um, that, uh, that can help with that. So if it is something you're having, talk to your plastic surgeon about it because there may be something that can help. All right. So um, Megan asked, uh, my original IMF, that's the, the inframammary fold, fold on the bottom of the breast, is still tight and is giving me double bubble deformity. Also, I have animation deformity just in that breast when flexing. Um, a tiny gap between areola and base of breast and surgeon had to lower IMF and score the tissue. Would be going back in and scoring original IMF make any difference? So from your question, um, I'm curious if you have, or if anyone's ever said that you have tuberous breast uh, deformity, uh, tuberous breast, and uh, regardless of whether someone's told you that or not, that the, the concept probably applies uh, to you given what you said your surgeon had to do, which is that in some people, the space in between the nipple and the original fold is very short, and that tissue is very tight, um, and, in those, and, and the fold is usually very high. So people with tuberous breast, that's usually the anatomy that happens. A short distance in between the nipple and the fold, the fold is really high, um, and that breast is usually small. It can be on one or, one or both sides, or both sides to a different degree. Um, implants are a great way to help with that, but also what you mentioned as far as um, lowering the fold and scoring the tissue is, is the way that you treat tuberous breast. Um, so it sounds like uh, that's what your surgeon did and implants uh, to expand the lower part of the breast. Now, anyone that I'm doing surgery on with tuberous breast, I tell them that they are very likely going to have double bubble initially, but it's important to understand why there's a double bubble because some double bubble is a sign of a complication and a sign of something that needs to be fixed. And some double bubble is a sign of Nothing is wrong at all. It's just 
your anatomy and the implant and the relationship between them and how things look. So um, the idea is, is that let's say in somebody uh, with uh, a fold, let's say that implant drops below that fold. So the implant slid below the fold. That person can have a double bubble because they can have a bubble or just fullness from their own breast and then their fold and then the implant sitting below it. So you have like bubble, fold, bubble. So that's what that double bubble is. Now that is a, a problem. That's something that needs to be fixed. That implant has dropped too low. That implant has bottomed out and the fold uh, wasn't strong enough. That fold needs to be repaired. So that requires a surgery to go in and reinforce the fold either with stitches or with mesh um, and get that implant back up. So that's a double bubble that needs to be fixed. And someone with tuberous breast that had surgery um, because the fold is usually lowered in that surgery, there's going to be some remnant of the old original IMF. So those are tight bands that are that caused the initial crease. And the implant can be in the exact position it's supposed to be in. It can be not bottomed out, it's in the right position, but there's a double bubble because you have the implant and then you have the old original IMF and then the breast tissue on top of it. And it can make it look like there's a double bubble. Now in that case, it isn't necessarily uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that something has gone wrong. It may be that that lower breast tissue, lower pull of the breast is not yet done changing. And I don't know how far you are, you are out from surgery, but after getting implants with tuberous breasts, uh, or even if you just had a high fold and uh, your surgeon had to do the things that you're describing, it takes a lot of time uh, for those changes to happen. Um, at least a year. So if you're in the one year, if you're less than a year, I'd say definitely the answer is give it time. Even if you're year one year, I'd say give it a little bit more time. Um, because again, there's nothing wrong. It's just that that lower part um, has to expand a little more. So let's say you're far out from surgery, you're two years out from surgery, um, and there's still a band there. So then it is reasonable to talk about, okay, uh, how pronounced is it? How much does it bother you? What would need to be done to make it better? <laughs> does scoring, like you said, need need to happen? Or does masking it by doing some fat transfer, where you take some fat and put it in the area of the original fold to try to minimize that appearance? So that's an option. Sometimes shape, changing the implant um, shape. So there are some different options, but it, uh, it depends on exactly your anatomy. Um, having animation you know, if you have an implant under the muscle, you will have animation. It's normal with an implant under the muscle to have some animation. So you had said animation deformity. Um, it's a deformity when it really is so significant that it causes problems day to day or really is causing the implants to push far off to the side. So uh, if you're noticing animation on that side and not the other side, especially if you're within you know, a year, I would say give it time because as everything relaxes, that muscle may release its grasp on the implant, helping it to settle a little bit more, expanding the lower part of the breast, improving the double bubble, and minimizing the animation that you have. So it could be that all of those things go together, is that right now your implant's a little high, the muscle has too much of a grasp on it, it's causing more animation, and it's not allowing the implant to um, expand the lower part of the breast. So um, that was kind of a lot of different things, but uh, uh, tuberous breast is a, a the most complicated anatomy that a uh, plastic surgeon that does breast surgery um, faces generally. And uh, one of the hardest things is that it takes a lot of time, a lot longer than anyone else to get to your final appearance. So hopefully that helps. Let us know if you have any other questions. Um, are compression garments necessary after a tummy tuck? So um, most plastic, or many plastic surgeons are gonna use compression after a tummy tuck, especially if there was liposuction done. Um, I do know some plastic surgeons that don't use compression uh, after a tummy tuck, but they also don't do liposuction. I think liposuction is a very, very important part of a tummy tuck. And that's why outside of people that literally have no fat on them and no liposuction to be done. But, but most people are gonna, are gonna benefit from some liposuction. And if there's liposuction, you wanna have compression. And uh, the reason why is that, um, and I get to see what things look like uh, under the skin after there's liposuction. Because I do liposuction and then I do the tummy tuck and I can see some of the area that I did liposuction in. And what it looks like, uh, people describe it as a honeycomb appearance. So picture like a, a honeycomb. 
Um, and you have all this space and this kind of network of wax or whatever honeycomb is made out of. Um, and that's kind of what things look like. And, and that network of structures are blood vessels and nerves and other important structures and things like that. But there's all this space where the fat has been sucked out from. And if you do liposuction and then just leave it, your body's going to fill that space um, with fluid. And if fluid stays there, it one is going to make your result not as good as it could be because you want that space to close. Picture like collapsing a honeycomb. You want that space to close so you can get as much contour and as much shape and definition um, as possible. Also, you don't want fluid pooling and sitting in there because it can uh, theoretically get infected and cause other issues. So especially when there's liposuction, you want to have compression. Um, and if your surgeon's doing a drainless tummy tuck, the, the area that we're able to close off so there's no room for fluid to collect is just the, the area in the front of the abdomen. Uh, we're not able to, because we're not making an incision all the way towards the back or all the way in the back, those what are called progressive tension stitches that are used to close off that space so there's no room for fluid to collect, that's not being done in the area of liposuction in the flanks in the back. It's only being done in the abdomen uh, so really you need compression specifically for the flanks to really help um, with that area. So um, I know that they're not always so comfortable. Uh, we here at Amelia, I, I think I've found um, the most comfortable ones, but it's always a balance between comfort but also function. You want to have something that's giving really good compression. If it was the most comfortable, then it probably isn't giving us good compression. Sometimes people ask, like, can I just go try this other compression? And it's important to use the one that your plastic surgeon um, recommends because uh, that's what what they've had good experience with. But good question. Um, for anyone on here, if you guys have any questions uh, about anything, definitely write them in here. I still have a list um, of some other questions here I'll keep going through. But thank you guys all for being here. All right. So here's one. Um, Amy said, my surgery is tomorrow. Congratulations, that's awesome. Uh, and I'm getting so nervous. It is normal to be nervous. Everybody gets a little bit nervous. You're gonna do awesome. Um, she said she would love to know more about the Galaflex mesh. Uh, we may go with it tomorrow once my surgeon is operating. <coughs> I'm going with overs after a bad reaction with unders in March. Um, I've breastfed three babies in my tissues of the mom variety. Uh, he agreed subfascial placing with Galaflex possibly for support. Can it be felt? Are there no complications? Has it affect healing? Um, and then another question after that, but we'll start with the Galaflex. So Galaflex uh, mesh is a, it's not permanent. Um, your body, does, it dissolves and your body replaces with its own scar tissue. Um, and it is used throughout plastic surgery. It's been used for a while. Uh, it's, it's not the kind of mesh that you hear about on commercials causing is issues. Uh, it's, not, it's not vaginal mesh, things like that. So it's a very safe um, mesh. Um, can one feel it inside? Usually you can't feel it. Now, uh, you may be able to feel an edge or something if there's a fold or crease or something like that, especially if you're thin. Um, but it's not permanent, so it will dissolve and your body will, will replace it with its own tissue. So um, are there known complications? So this mesh is really safe um, and, and used, like I said, throughout plastic surgery. Um, you know, one thing that's really important when putting mesh in is wherever the mesh is, is where the implant's going to stay. So <laughs> there's a chance if the mesh isn't put in the right place, if it's put too low or too high, that there could be implant position problems. Um, but, but generally it's being used to give support and, and people have really good results with it. Um, how does it affect healing time? It shouldn't affect healing time or limitations. Uh, it's really just adding additional support for your implant. Uh, there's still this kind of six week time frame where your tissues need um, six weeks for everything to get to as strong as it's going to be with or without mesh. So I don't, it wouldn't change anything for me in terms of uh, healing or recovery restrictions or anything. Um, you, had, you asked also a lot of women in this group post about Cientra um, and you're having Allergan, Trail Cohesive. Have people been happy with that brand? Yeah, so both Cientra and Allergan are major, uh, major implant brands in the US and both 
um, have been around for a long time, and millions of people have Allergan implants, Sientra implants, uh, both have a very long, long line of safety. Um, so if you're getting Allergan and Trell implants, you're, you're great. Um, and uh, th there are, in terms of Sientra versus Allergan, um, one of the main differences is that the, the warranties are a little bit different, so that's something to talk to your plastic surgeon about. Um, but otherwise, the implants are, are very similar. Um, I use uh, mostly Sientra implants. Um, occasionally, we'll use Allergan implants too, but um, I think Sientra implants are great. Uh, okay, so a few other questions you guys wrote in here. Um, you go in November 18th for breast augmentation. Do you think after nine days I could be back in my bulletproof vest? Um, so, and I assume going back to work. Um, so, yeah, after nine days, uh, you can go back into a bulletproof vest. Um, like Megan chimed in here, you, you still may have some soreness. Um, you know, I, I think the more important than wearing a vest, because I don't know that I've never worn a bulletproof vest, um, even if it's putting some pressure on the top part of your chest. I mean, obviously there's weight there, but um, I don't think it's going to cause any problems. Um, just one thing to be careful about if you if you're going back to work and it's something that you need a bulletproof vest for. Um, in those first weeks, you want to be careful not to do something that's going to potentially cause bleeding. Um, and that doesn't mean you, you can't go back to work for six weeks, but just to be mindful and aware of that. Um, having bleeding around the implant uh, is really uncommon, thankfully, a hematoma. But times when it happens, it usually comes with a kind of dramatic story of somebody slips on the steps and grabs the handrail and just tears something, and then there's a lot of swelling, or a dog pulls you know, their arm on a leash or, or something like that. Um, so if you are going back to work and your work is potentially more physical, just being aware of what can you do to just protect yourself in that way in those in those first few weeks. Um, and then somebody asked to use the saline. Uh, I assume you mean saline implants. Um, so there's silicone. Usually when people talk about gel, they mean silicone implants, silicone gel implants, or saline implants. Um, there used to be implants a long time ago that were a mix of saline and silicone, but at least in the U.S., uh, they don't do that anymore. Um, and then there's the ideal implant, which is a saline implant, but the idea is, is that it's supposed to feel uh, more like a silicone implant, um, which uh, those uh, I don't generally use. I haven't found patients to be happy with them. Um, so I, I generally use silicone implants, usually gummy bear implants. That's what basically everybody in my practice goes with nowadays. Um, and if you haven't yet gotten to feel one, um, when you generally when you go to a consultation you'll get to feel one but this is a uh, Sientra gummy bear implant um, and uh, there's a lot out there uh, about you know silicone versus saline and people you know choose either one for different reasons but most people in, in my practice at least go with a silicone implant like this um, they're the most natural looking and feeling implants they're designed um, to move and feel and look like breast tissue um, that's that's an, an important thing that um, that I like to, to bring up. But saline is salt water, and there's no way to change this the way that the saline acts. It's just water. I mean, you fill it during surgery, um, and it's just water. So water is water, and it moves the way that it moves. Um, the silicone that's inside of a silicone implant has changed a lot over the decades. Um, it's improved significant significantly because. Um, they are able to change, while silicone is silicone, they're able to change the way that the silicone interacts with other silicone particles, um, a silicone inside of the implant, they are able to change the way that the silicone interacts with the shell of the implant. So there's a lot of things that they can do um, to improve the way that the implant moves and feels and looks and what happens if there's ever a rupture. Um, you know, the older silicone implants, if there's a rupture, would leak out silicone with these implants. Like you've, you've seen, I'm sure, videos of people cutting them down the middle and, and squeezing it, and you see a silicone balloon out and goes back in. So there's a lot of, of research and technology that's gone into these silicone implants, um, and that's, why, that's what most people go with nowadays. Um, really, uh, you know, the, the 
only thing that a silicone implant really can't do is it can't tell you right away if you have a rupture. And that would really be the only time that someone, for the most part, you know, should choose a saline implant is if, if that's really important to you to know very quickly if you have a rupture, a saline implant, that's how it's going to deflate. Now, I, I think that that's a, a downside a lot of the time because that could be pretty inconvenient uh, if you're on vacation somewhere and one side ruptures um, or just until you can get in with your surgeon to, to get it replaced. So um, I think that's a downside. With a silicone implant, with one of these implants, if there's a rupture, uh, you may not know it. Uh, but that's not a bad thing because from everything we know, it's not dangerous to have a ruptured implant. Uh, really, the only way with these uh, gummy bear implants to know for sure that you have a rupture would be with some sort of imaging like ultrasound or an MRI. And some people choose to get that imaging um, every so often to look for a rupture and the warranties cover uh, replacement if there ever is a rupture. Um, all right. So uh, another question here. We'll just answer Michelle's question real quick because we were talking about the saline. You've lost 125 pounds of weight, lost surgery. That's amazing. Uh, it's really incredible. Um, it, it's it's one of the neat one of the things that gives me a lot of um, uh, a, lot, a lot of satisfaction in being a plastic surgeon is I get to um, meet many of you uh, who have these inc incredible journeys of, of um, you know, different stories, everybody has their own story, but especially people that have lost a lot of weight. It's really incredible um, how much uh, work and, and life change and, and sacrifice and all those things uh, you all have done. And uh, I'm just one small part of it when, when I'm involved with surgery after that, whether it's a lift or uh, tummy tuck or something like that, uh, or thigh lift or, or arm lift, but um, it's really incredible. Um, you asked how long do you need to wait before a consult for mommy makeover? Um, so if you are, if you've lost a lot of weight, um, you want to wait until your weight loss is stable uh, before having a consult. A consult uh, here at, at Amelia is really uh, designed for once you are ready for surgery um, and uh, in someone that's lost a lot of weight, you really want to wait until your weight is stable before you're ready for surgery because, and I would say even regardless of the plastic surgeon you're seeing, I mean, you don't want to see a plastic surgeon and then say, okay, you are a candidate for a, a standard tummy tuck and then you lose more weight and then the next time they see you, they say you're a candidate for a, a fleur de lis tummy tuck, which is a whole, which is different. Um, and then they need, you need to kind of go through that. So I think it's better to wait until things are stable before uh, having a consult in general. Um, and then as far as wait time, every surgeon's different. Um, and uh, in, if you're looking at an Amelia surgeon, you can always go on askamelia.com and go to book online and you can see when our next available is. Um, so uh, Brittany asked, uh, she had a, a lift and implants in June, um, and then in one month, the implants were taken out due to an allergic reaction to the sutures. Plus, surgeon will be using normal sutures. Will they hold up strong, and how long will they be in for? Um, I, I'm sorry that that happened, that, um, that you had to have your implants taken out. But I'm glad that you have a plan with your plastic surgeon to, it sounds like, to get the implants put back in. Um, having an allergic reaction to dissolvable sutures, a, a, real, a real reaction is really uncommon. Um, I'm not sure what your plastic surgeon means by normal. I mean, dissolvable stitches uh, would be normal, at least in my practice. Um, that's essentially all that I use. Um, it's possible that your plastic surgeon is going to change the type of dissolvable stitches that they're using um, and try something different, and maybe that's what they mean. Um, it may be that your plastic surgeon wants to use some permanent or non-dissolvable stitch and remove it. Um, and that, that's something to talk to them about. Um, but uh, there really is, uh, I'm not sure exactly what, what they would mean by normal. Um, 
but uh, it's a good idea if you did have a reaction to those stitches to not use those same stitches again and try something different. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, so, uh, so yeah, they're, they're probably just going to try a different type of stitch, whether it's dissolvable or permanent. As far as how long they'll be in for, if it's a stitch that has to be removed, uh, you know, you usually remove stitches about one or two weeks. Um, but again, it depends exactly what kind of stitch and, and exactly what technique they're using. Um, hopefully that helps. Anyone, for anyone that's there, feel free to write any questions in. Um, I'm going to go back to my list and keep going a little bit. Let's see, we're almost at the bottom of the list. Okay. Um, so somebody asked, are you cold when you wake up in the recovery room? Should you wear a warmer outfit for when you, when you wake up, <laughs> excuse me, um, after surgery to go home? It's a good question. Um, so uh, if you've had surgery before, or if you've heard from people that have had surgery before, they may talk about how they woke up shivering um, or shaking. That's actually a very common and normal reaction to anesthesia. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're cold. We actually, uh, in, the, in the operating room, are very careful to make sure we keep patients warm. Um, and that's important because you know, during surgery, depending on what surgery you have, you have some amount of your body is exposed. You don't have clothes on, whether it's your chest or if it's a mommy makeover, it's your chest and abdomen. So it'd be really easy to get cold. So because of that, uh, it's standard in surgery to have different types of warmers, whether it's um, circulating warm air over your body or actually under your body. Um, there's a, something called bear huggers is what they're called. That's what we use here. And uh, that helps keep people warm, and we use them also in recovery. So um, you may wake up shivering. It doesn't necessarily mean you're cold, just more reaction to anesthesia. Um, should you wear a warmer outfit for when you wake up from after surgery to go home? Certainly, if you're having surgery and it's going to be cold out, um, I would bring some warmer things, a nice, you know, comfortable sweatpants and a hoodie or something. Um, you may feel like you're, you know, you're cold, uh, you know, going out. So definitely having different options of layers, things, uh, hoodies are good because you don't want to have to put your arms through a sweatshirt or something like that, but just something you can slip on each arm. And um, I'm amazed by uh, the different comfortable pants that people wear to surgery. So people do a good job of choosing comfortable pants for surgery. All right, that's a good question. Um, somebody else asked, what is the risk of bouncing and how long to avoid? Um, so, in general, after getting implants, um, you want the implants to settle to where they're going to be and you don't want things moving around too much until that pocket has formed around the implant. So generally we say six weeks until that pocket has formed around the implant. That doesn't mean that you can't do things for six weeks, but certain things that are going to cause a lot of movement um, or bouncing, you know, things like that. People ask me sometimes, what about going on a roller coaster? Like, I would say six weeks is a good amount of time to say, once you get to six weeks, movement is not going to cause issues. Before then, um, it may cause one implant to settle in a little bit of a different position. So I think it makes sense to wait six weeks before doing things that are going to cause a lot of movement of your chest. All right. Another question here, uh, amateur bodybuilder planning to get a lift and implants after healing time are most women able to train again and train upper body including, including chest? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of my patients um, uh, train and do chest and upper body exercise. If you are a bodybuilder, then an important conversation to have, uh, you're welcome Zoe, uh, important conversation to have with your surgeon is over versus under uh, the muscle. Oftentimes with a bodybuilder, we're going to put the implant over the muscle. Um, because with training chest, if you're under the muscle, it's going to push those implants out to the side. There's a few exceptions. I have some patients that um, are um, bodybuilders or more competitive swimsuit models and things, and, and they tell me that they're really not focusing on chest exercise. Um, and so I think a, a thoughtful conversation with your surgeon as far as really what exercises do you do, um, where's the focus, and what are the pros of and cons of over versus under the muscle, and then decide what you want to do. But, um, but regardless, after healing time, you're absolutely able to train um, and train upper body. I always tell people, especially if you're if you're doing you know serious chest exercise, ease back into it. Realize that you haven't 
done that for a little bit of time, you don't want to get injured. So just kind of ease into things and then you can go back to doing what you want. Hopefully that helps. All right, back to my list. That's, that's all the questions that I have. Do you guys have any other questions? If you do, you can write in anything else about breast and body. If not, we can talk about a few different things. So we have a little bit more time. So um, let's talk about let's talk about different types of tummy tucks. Um, but real quick, Rebecca asked, is there a drop in fluff stage after an implant exchange? Um, so it depends what was done, how much was done. Usually a lot less than getting implants the first time around because uh, the pocket is already there. If it's a simple, straightforward implant exchange, there may be very little. There's some swelling, so there's going to some be a little bit more fullness at the top, and things will have to settle just a little bit. Um, if there was more pocket work that's done, it could be that there's some drop and fluff that has to happen. If there was a big change in implant size, um, it may be that there's some um, some drop and fluff that needs to happen. Um, so it just depends on how much was done. But straightforward implant exchange, really not so much drop and fluff. Hopefully that helps. Um, so for tummy tucks, there's different terms. There's kind of three different categories of tummy tucks that you might hear about. There's, uh, or four even. So there's standard tummy tuck. Um, <coughs> there's um, extended tummy tuck. There's a mini tummy tuck. And there's something called a fleur de lis tummy tuck or FDL. So we can talk about it for a few minutes about some of those differences there. So um, standard tummy tuck is your standard tummy tuck, and uh, in a standard tummy tuck, make an incision above from above the belly button, remove all the skin from the area above the belly button to kind of the hair area, um, and uh, all that gets removed. The skin is pulled down over the belly button, and then a new opening is made um, for the belly button. So it's the same belly button that you always had, but a new opening was made for it. A uh, extended tummy tuck, basically what that means is that if you have more extra skin, you want your surgeon to extend the incision further, kind of getting closer and closer to your back, because what you don't want is you don't want to have a shorter tummy tuck scar, but then folds of skin at the end. So there's a term for that called dog ears. It's not a great term, but um, you don't want to have a shorter tummy tuck incision, but extra skin still. So you want that incision to be as long as it needs to be to get the extra skin out. Um, and that's what an extended tummy tuck is. Um, a fleur de lis, FDL, fleur de lis tummy tuck, uh, is generally in people that have lost a lot of weight, um, oftentimes people that have had bariatric surgery. And the idea is, is that in everybody, there's extra skin in kind of two directions. There's extra skin in the up and down direction, and that's what gets removed with the tummy tuck and everything is pulled down. There's also extra skin in the side to side direction. Now in a tummy tuck, that doesn't change so much because everything is being pulled down, but skin isn't being removed and, and your things are not being pulled in this way as much. Now the, the waistline is pulled in, but the skin is not really being tightened in that direction so much. And in, in most people that uh, it is needed. Um, now in people that have lost a lot of weight, um, there's extra, a lot of extra skin in both directions. And in those people, not only do you need skin removed like a standard or an extended tummy tuck, but you also need skin removed up and down this way. And then you need to, everything to be pulled in this way. So everything is pulled down and everything's pulled in this way. And because everything's pulled in this way, you have a scar that goes from the top towards the bottom. Um, so that is a, in comparison to the standard tummy tuck scar, that is a uh, long scar that can't be hidden. Uh, and it's a, a, you know, a trade-off for moving the extra skin. So generally, unless there's really a lot of extra skin, uh, we're not doing a fleur de lis tummy tuck. But in people that have a lot of extra skin, then it can be a good thing to do. Um, Mini tummy tuck uh, is, in my practice, is not so common because um, in most people that have had at least one pregnancy, I feel that with the progressive tension suture technique, with the drainless technique, I'm able to do a standard tummy tuck and give a really low scar 
um, and they're going to have a better result than with just a, a mini tummy tuck because a mini tummy tuck is removing a lot less skin. Uh, people will often ask in a mini tummy tuck if I'm repairing the muscle. I actually do believe that it's very important in a mini tummy tuck to repair the full length of muscle. Um, there are definitely plastic surgeons out there that don't, but I think in a mini tummy tuck, uh, it's, it's important to repair that muscle too. But a lot less skin is removed and the result's going to be a lot, um, a lot less dramatic. So generally a standard tummy tuck is going to be a better way to go in most people. Um, so uh, Megan, going back to uh, your issue with double bubble. Um, so uh, what I think you're saying is you have, that you have uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and your skin elasticity isn't good. Yeah, and your surgeon didn't want to swap to overs due to potential sagging down the line. How quick would we expect to see sagging? Um, so that's a good question. I mean, if you have a genetic difference in your skin elasticity, um, I, I wouldn't swap to overs either. I mean, I would agree that swapping to overs, and I guess that you, you bring that up because you're talking about with the animation, but swapping to overs, if there's issues with your skin elasticity, could potentially cause problems with them sagging more. So um, I think it's worth talking to them about mesh. Uh, it, it may make sense if, the, if things are dropping down too low, if the implants are, are dropping down too low, that mesh is an important thing to do. But it just depends on your specific anatomy. Um, if you haven't yet uh, joined the Ask a Surgeon group, um, Ask a Surgeon page within BusMob. So there's the main page that you guys are in now, and then there's the Ask a Surgeon group. Um, all the Amelia surgeons uh, hang out in there, and we you, you can share your pictures. So if you haven't, you're more than welcome to share your picture in there, and then uh, one of us will, will chime in, and that might be helpful too. Hopefully that Hopefully that helps. If you guys have any other questions, you can hang out for a few more minutes, but all right. Um, thank you all so much uh, for, for being a part of this group and just being so uh, supportive and just a great, really incredible uh, group of people out there. So. Um, you're all great, and if you're watching this on Instagram and you're not part of the BusMob Facebook group, head over here, uh, head to busmob.com to join. Um, but uh, definitely check out the main you know, Facebook group. But um, thank you all for your great questions. Thanks for submitting them beforehand. Um, and um, one more snuck in here so we can answer it. Uh, you said I had tuberous breasts, see more upper pole volume in one more than the other. Have you experienced this with any patients? Is it normal? Yeah. So um, I'm glad people with tuberous breasts are, are asking questions because um, it's, at least in these groups, it's more common than you think. Um, I mean, I see people with tuberous breasts not uncommonly. Um, and uh, and it, it's important to know kind of the differences and what to expect and things like that. So I'm glad you're asking questions about it. So is it normal to have more upper pole volume um, on one side versus the other? So it absolutely can be normal. I mean, bottom line, tuberous breast or anyone with any significant asymmetry, um, that is a, th those are very challenging surgeries and there's always going to be some asymmetry. Nobody is perfectly symmetric. No one is supposed to be perfectly symmetric. Uh, and especially with the anatomy differences that happen in tuberous breast, your chances of having some asymmetry are going to be higher. So having some a bit more upper pole on one side versus the other um, is uh, not necessarily going to be something that's preventable. It may just be a normal part of where your implants sit. Now, if it's a significant difference, then that's something to talk to your plastic surgeon about. But if it's just something that you're able, you notice, and it is there, it, it may be that that is the most symmetric that you can have um, with your anatomy. So. Hopefully that helps. Um, thanks, Lori. Excited to see you tomorrow. Um, and uh, absolutely, Megan, thanks for your questions. So thank you all very much. Uh, this was fun. We'll do this again soon. And if you guys have any specific questions, definitely you can head to the Ask a Surgeon group um, and have a great rest of your guys' day. Thanks so much.